I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Some of you, I will just tell you right now, the screen says we're going to go verses 13 to 15. That is my goal, but you're going to have to hang with me, okay, because we are going to get going pretty efficiently, and uh, we'll see how far we get. So take your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 4. For the sake of context, I'd like to start reading in verse 6 to the end of the chapter, where it says in verse 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Verse 9, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which is bestowed on you through, the, through prophetic utterances, with the laying on of hands by the presbyter. Verse 15, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us your ways so that we may walk in your truth. We ask that you would be honored and glorified in Christ's name. Amen. If you remember many weeks ago, we embarked on this section of scripture where we were looking at if you and I are going to be servants of Christ, we are going to do these following characteristics. Now I understand that we're talking to, Paul's talking to Timothy, who is a pastor. I understand these things apply to me, but I think if we look at the entirety of scripture, they apply to all of us. And those are, we saw many weeks ago, that if you're going to be a servant of Christ, you're going to be saturated with the Word of God, verse 6. Secondly, you're going to protect the Word of God, verse 7. You're going to flee heresies against the Word of God, verse 7 and 8. You're going to, discipline for, you're going to be disciplined for the pursuit of godliness. You're going to be committed to hard work. You're, we're going to prescribe and teach with authority. We're going to live out our faith, verse 12. In verses 13 to 15, I want us to understand how we are to be involved in biblical ministry. As we continue this morning, we're going to learn about, one, the priority of biblical ministry. Two, we're going to look at the model of biblical ministry. And thirdly, we're going to look at the pursuit of biblical ministry. And the question that I would like all of us to contemplate is this. To what extent... Are you and I involved in biblical ministry? To what extent are we involved in biblical ministry? In verse 13, it says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. I want us to see the first thing is that we're going to look at, number one, the priority of biblical ministry. In verse 13, he says, give attention. Here's a question that I spent a lot of time thinking about, and I'll throw it to you as well. What things do you pay attention to? And you can think on it today, but what things do you pay attention to? I'm sorry, I just got something in my eye. So hold on, time out. Maybe the Lord's saying, you're not going to go fast today. All right, what what do you pay attention to? What? You know, it, there's a lot of things that I don't pay attention to. As a kid, there was a lot of things I didn't pay attention to that my parents told me to pay attention to. You know, I tell my kids a lot of times to do something, and 
Sometimes they pay attention and other times they don't. Of course, none of them in here today I'm talking about. My younger ones. But what do you pay attention to? We pay attention, hopefully, at our jobs. I would hope you pay attention on the road. Um, I would hope you would... Oftentimes we pay attention to the news or we really pay attention when we come up on an election year, right? But what are you paying attention to all of the time? It's interesting, this phrase, give attention, it's a, an imperative. In other words, it's not optional. Paul says, Timothy, if you're going to be a good servant of Christ, you are going to pay attention. But he tells them specifically what he's going to pay attention to. What do we pay attention to? The idea of the, the Greek word, it has the idea of, of being devoted to. The same word we find in the Septuagint, that is the Old Testament in the Greek. These will be on the screen. We're going to go really quick. But in Psalm chapter 5, verse 2, he says, Heed the sound of my cry for help. It's the same word as pay attention. Heed. It says it again in Psalm 10, 17. Oh, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. Psalm 17, 1. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Psalm 55, 2. Give heed to me and answer me. As the psalmist is pouring out his heart to God, he says, give heed. That's the same idea of the words we find in our text this morning where he says, give attention. We see it in Psalm 66, 19, but certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Psalm 86, 6, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and give heed to the voice of my supplication. Isn't that a great thing that when you and I pray, God hears us? The psalmist says, God, heed my prayer. Listen to it. What do we pay attention to? Well, I did a little bit of a word study this week on, on this idea of paying attention. Jesus said, watch out for the false teachers. Jesus said, heed this warning in Matthew 7, 15. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus said, watch out for the influence of the, Phar the Pharisees' teaching. In Matthew 16, 6, Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The teens, we were talking about that this morning, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But, but Jesus gave a warning. He goes, watch out for their teaching." In Matthew 16, 11, he says the same thing. Watch out. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. In Luke 12, in Luke 20, he says, Beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and cheese seats, uh, seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. You see, Jesus himself said several times, Pay attention. Pay attention to the false teachers. Watch out for what they say. But Jesus also, or actually Paul did, in the pastoral letters, Paul says, don't pay attention to the Jewish myths. In Titus chapter 1, verse 14, it's one of the pastoral epistles. He says, verse 14, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. We saw it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. As Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, Nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. If we went to uh, Philippians chapter 3, we see it there where, where Paul says, Watch out for the teaching of the Judaizers. Paul instructs the elders of Ephesus to watch over themselves and the flock in Acts 20:28. 20, he says, be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. 
Sorry, I just realized I didn't start my timer. <laughs> so if I start it now, I'm sorry, hold on. <laughs> At least I see the red light flashing saying, finish, finish, finish. Not that I listen to it. So all of those examples I just gave you were kind of the uh, be on guard against that which is wrong. But it's used in a, a positive sense. In Acts chapter 16, verse 40, in a positive sense, it's a paying attention in relation to Lydia. In Acts 16, verse 14, listen to what it says. It says, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was what? was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. We're also told in Scripture to pay attention to the message of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, the idea of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. He is over all. Hebrews 2, 1, it says, For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away from it. He puts it in the positive sense. Well, in our text, he, he says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, give attention. But he gives specific things that he's supposed to pay attention to. He says, pay attention to the reading, the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. You see here, Paul is challenging Timothy. He says, Timothy, the priority of biblical ministry is the Word of God. He says, the first thing is you need to read the Scriptures as a pastor. You need to read the Scripture, the idea of this Word. It is public reading. Listen to these passages in Acts. In Acts chapter 13, verse 15, he says, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Reading of the law and the prophets. You all know, that's the Old Testament, right? I mean, the law would be the first five books. We all love Leviticus, right? This is just read the scriptures. Let me show you something. Well, in 2 Corinthians 3.14, it says, But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. It was the reading of the old covenant. But take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. This is a, a justification that I don't need to set my clock anymore. Okay? Listen to what they did in Nehemiah's day. In Nehemiah chapter 8, I'll have it on the screen, but it gets a little small. But in verse, we'll read the first eight verses. Nehemiah 8, 1. It says, And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Verse 3. He read from it before the square, which is in front of the water gate, from, get this, early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood all of these people, the end of verse 4 says, On his left hand, verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. 
And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 7, and yada, 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 yada. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Wow. They read the word of God. And the part that got me, and I've known this for years, but from early morning to midday, reading the first five books of the Bible. Those are our favorite, right? Leviticus, I mean, all of that. They just read it. Wow. Paul says, Timothy, if you're going to be a servant of God, you have got to read the Scripture. You've got to publicly read the Scripture. But he goes on in verse 13. He says you need to, uh, for exhortation from the Scriptures. Well, what is meant by exhortation? I can't fully develop this right now. But paraclesis has the idea of encouragement or comfort, the act of earnestly supporting or encouraging a response or action from those who hear God's word. Some would say it has the same idea. They would say it's reading, preaching, or teaching, and then preaching. He says, a biblical ministry... He says it's got the priority of biblical ministry is the word of God to reading it. Secondly, he says exhortation from the scriptures. We looked at this verse just a minute ago in Acts 13, 15, when he says after reading the law and then in the end, he says, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. In Romans 12, 8, it says he who exhorts in his exhortation, talking about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14. It says, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation. 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Exhortation of the scriptures is essential for a biblical ministry. This word paraclesis has the idea of consolation, comfort, comfort and or encouragement. In fact, Paul's second letter to Corinth is colored with words of comfort containing 11 instances of paraclesis, which is over a third of the total occurrences of the Greek word in the New Testament. Paul says, Timothy, you have got to read the word of God. He says you've got to be committed to exhortation of the word of God. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 9.31. I want to show you what the source of all comfort is or who it comes from. In Acts 9.31, it tells us. And this would be the idea of the word exhortation. In Acts 9.31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord. And in the, here it is, comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. The source of all comfort, the word exhortation, is the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, Timothy, if you're going to be a servant of God, the priority of a biblical ministry is the reading of the scriptures, the exhortation of the scriptures, and thirdly, he says, it is the teaching of the scriptures. Teaching is the activity, the activities of educating or instructing, the activities that impart knowledge or skill. Well, we find this all throughout scripture in Romans 12. Talking about spiritual gifts, it says, In service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. In Colossians, 
chapter 2, verse 20, it says, If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? If you remember our study in Colossians, it was the preeminence of Christ. He is over all. And there was a group of people that come into the church at Colossae that were saying, look, you just need to do all these rules and rituals in order for you to obtain salvation. And Paul says, that's not right. The third thing that Paul tells Timothy, he says, if you're going to have a biblical ministry, you have to teach the word of God. We're going to look at it in a couple of weeks in verse 16 when Paul says you got to be committed to self-examination where he says pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. We find the same word in 1 Timothy 5, 17 where it says the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. In 2 Timothy 3:10. Paul says, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, love, patience. Patience, love, perseverance. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? Teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. The idea of the Greek word for teaching really is twofold. Number one, that teaching is taught. This is the idea of doctrine. I can't show you all these passages, but we see it in Ephesians 4, Colossians 2, 1 Timothy 1. You are to teach, Timothy, you are to teach doctrine. Secondly, you are to teach and provide instruction, call to living it out. Romans 15, 4, 2 Timothy 3, 10, 3, 16. It's interesting, the guy by the name of Donald Guthrie says this, quote, the, the verb, okay, in verse 13, the verb, give attention, implies previous preparation in private. It encompasses not just the act of teaching, but all the commitment, study, and preparation associated with it. End quote. Paul says, Timothy, if you are going to be a good servant of Christ, then you better pour over the word of God day in and day out. He says, this is the, I forgot what my number one was. I can't, the, the priority of biblical ministry is the word of God. Secondly, I want us to look very quickly. I want us to look at the model of biblical ministry. Look at verse 14 with me. He says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which is bestowed on you through, the, through prophetic utterances, with a laying on of hands by the presbyter the elders he says do not neglect this is an imperative command he says if you're going to be a servant of christ don't you withhold your spiritual gift don't you neglect these things the idea of just take the two words do neglect Okay? And I know he puts it in a negative. He says, don't neglect. So what's the idea of these, this word, do neglect? He says, to not care for, to not feel a concern or an interest for. You know, the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, he says in verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He says, Timothy, if you're going to be a servant of God, don't withhold your spiritual gift. Friends, if you're going to be involved in biblical ministry, you will use your spiritual gift, right? God has gifted each one of us, and we get to employ that in serving the body of Christ. This is amazing stuff. He goes on in the verse, and, and he, he says to Timothy, don't neglect but he says, Timothy, you got to remember, A, God has gifted you. God has given you a spiritual gift. The idea of the spiritual gift, God is, is showing you grace. God has given you a, a present 
given as a sign of benefact favor. God has gifted each one of us. Paul says, Timothy, the model of biblical ministry is that you are going to realize that God has gifted you. In Romans 12, 6, he talks about spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, I'm just going to jump through some of these verses. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and following, it all talks about that God has gifted every believer with a spiritual gift. And then as brothers and sisters, we get to use it within the body of Christ. I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. He's talking to Timothy. And he says, For this reason, Timothy, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. It's easy for those of us who preach and teach and read the word of God. Discouragement is a real thing. And I think... Timothy got discouraged in the work of the ministry, don't you? When you read First and Second Timothy, I think he got discouraged. And in chapter 2, or in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, Timothy, let me fan those hot coals, those spiritual gifts that God has given you. Let me just fan those into flame. Let me get you, let me encourage you to use your spiritual gift. But I think it applies for all of us. Do you believe that God has gifted you? God has gifted every... Who knows what their spiritual gift is? You know this is a loaded question if you don't raise your hand, right? Because God has gifted you. My friends, let me just encourage you. Fan that gift into flame. Get using it for Jesus. Because God knows that you're special. God has given you a gift. Use it for His glory. If you don't know what it is, don't beat yourself up about it. And I jokingly say it all the time, but I can't. The, the only way that I figured mine out is I just started doing it. And you know what? I remember early on when I was trying to figure out if the Lord was calling me to full time ministry, there was a lengthy, lengthy conversation that says, Does Jake have the, the gift to teach or does he just have the gift to talk? And, it, and guys, it made me so mad. I'm so mad because I was like, I. I don't know. Do I have the gift of gab? I don't know. Maybe. But it just discouraged me so much. And I was like, Lord, I, I love you. And I just kept trying to do the best that I could. If you don't know your gift, just start serving somewhere. And God makes it really clear what your, yours is. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stir, as stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here's a question, though, that came to my mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. What in the world was Timothy's spiritual gift? I couldn't find anywhere where it told me what his spiritual gift was. One commentator says this, quote, Each believer's gift is a God-designed blend of spiritual capability, which acts as a channel through which the Spirit of God ministers to others. They would say Timothy's gift included evangelism, preaching, teaching, and leadership. And I looked up some of these verses, and I was like, oh, I see how they got there. If you want these references, I'll give them really quick. 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 4.16, 4.11, 4.13, So Paul says, here's the model of biblical ministry. Timothy, remember God has gifted you. And then he, he says in verse 14, God has confirmed his gifting in you. Look at 1 Timothy 4.14. He says, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterances with the laying hands, with the laying on of hands by the elders. It was bestowed on you. It was given to you. It was granted to you. It was given to you as your possession, Timothy. God has gifted you. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. 
See, God bestowed it. God has gifted each one of us. God has gifted you. God has gifted me. But I, one of my favorite verses in 1 John 3, 1, listen to how this word is used. It says, see how great a love the Father has what? Has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are for this reason. The world does not know us because it did not know him. God has bestowed on us his love. God confirmed Timothy's gifting. He uses the phrase prophetic utterances. This is through prophecy. This would be from God. It would be a representative declaration of the mind, will, or knowledge of God, especially concerning past, present, or future manifestations of the outworking of His will or other events. We find the, the idea of prophetic utterances. We find it in 1 Thessalonians 5.20. We find it in our text this morning. We find it in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1-9. through 9. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that. But in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 15, just listen to verse 7. It says, But you be strong and do not lose courage, for there is a reward for your work. Verse 8, Now when Asa heard these words and the prophecy, that's the same idea of prophetic utterances in our text. We find the, the, the word in Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. It says, And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophecy prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Idio, and they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And I just want to show you from Ezra, and I can't go through it all, but when Ezra was, was ministering, when the events of Ezra were taking place, you had the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah that were also taking place at the same time. And if we went and we read Haggai and Zechariah, we would see how they were talking about future events. This is the same idea of what's taking place in our text when it talks about prophetic utterances. In Nehemiah 6.12, it says, And I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Do you remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls. Do you remember? Okay? And then they try to create discouragement and try to stop them from doing God's will and rebuild the walls and sand ballot came on the scene and all these things were happening. Well, there was these prophecies that were spoken of. Think about the Apostle Paul. Who, who called Paul? Who called Saul? And changed his name to Paul. Who? God, right? God did. In Acts 13, verse 1, it says, Now, now there were at Antioch in the church... That was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called uh, Niger, and all these other people. Verse 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, who? Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Who called Paul? God did, right? God did, and we see the prophecy of that in Scripture. Well, what about Timothy? How was Timothy called? Most likely, it took place in Acts chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Paul came, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Verse 3, Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Maybe that's kind of where God called, and God began, God began the work in Timothy's life. He says, Paul, go get Timothy. Well, how does God call people today? God doesn't speak down and go, Richard, you are going to be a pastor next week, right? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You see, we, and this is a huge topic, if we get into, is the gift of prophecy practiced today? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Long ago, he spoke to us through prophets, but in these last days, he spoke to us through his son. You see, in our day, God, in our day, God calls men into full-time ministry, not through special revelation, rather through his providence. 
If God desires a man to be in the ministry, he gives him the desire and opens up the door for the opportunity for the man to serve. God doesn't audibly say, you are going to be a pastor. You see, Timothy was called by God to be used by God. God confirmed his gifting through prophetic, through prophetic utterances in the lives of Timothy. But then it was godly men who confirmed the gifting through the laying on of hands by the elders. The endowing of the man, imparting a state condition or authority. In 2 Timothy 1.6, where, where, where Paul says, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God. And he says, Timothy, the gift was, was confirmed in you by the laying on of hands. All right, number three, and I, I know I'm, I'm skipping stuff, so the guy's doing the PowerPoint, great job, I'm sorry. Number three, the pursuit of biblical ministry. The pursuit of biblical ministry. Look at verse 15. He says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. This is the pursuit of biblical ministry. You've got to be sold out for God no matter the cost. And, and that applies to all of us, doesn't it? If you are going to be a servant of God, you better be sold out for God no matter the cost. You better be okay with being called a Jesus follower. You don't need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He says, Timothy, take pains with it. This is an imperative command. It is not optional. He says, Timothy, if you're going to be a servant of God, you are going to to take pains with it. You are going to practice it. You are going to learn it by repetition and strenuous effort. You are going to pour over the Word of God. How about Joshua 1.8 where it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Paul says, Timothy, you've got to be sold out for God no matter the cost. Psalm 1 talks about it. You'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. He is going to be sold out. He is going to have roots so deep that he cannot be shaken no matter the cost. Because he knows his God. He is going to continue to pursue biblical ministry all of his life. There's going to be continual growth in your pursuit of holiness. He says you're to be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Your gradual improvement or growth of development as it pertains to your walk with Jesus. It was used in a uh, as a military term, to speak of advancing force. The Stoics use the word to speak of advancing in learning, understanding, or knowledge. But Paul says, Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, you have to have a pursuit for biblical ministry no matter the cost. You've got to continually grow in your personal pursuit of holiness. You've got to plead with people through the through the reading of Scripture, to the exhortation of Scripture, to the teaching of God's Word, you've got to plead with them to grow as well. An excellent minister is to be advancing to Christ's likeness, and his people should be able to mark his progress. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Do you know where Paul was when he wrote Philippians? He was in prison. You know how many times the word joy is used or spoken of in the book of Philippians? Yeah, that's your homework. Go read it today and write down every time he used the word rejoice or joy. He writes and he says, it's turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Because that's okay. I don't mind that I'm in, in prison. 
he still can talk about Jesus. Philippians 1.25, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. You remember Paul in Philippians 1, it says he was hard-pressed in both directions. He wanted to go and be with the Lord, right? He says, for me to die, for me, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. And then he says, I'm hard-pressed. He goes, I want to go be with Jesus, but I want to continue on and, and encourage you to walk with Jesus. Well, that's like a no-brainer for us. I'm going to see Jesus. Peace out. Right? Paul says, it's more important for me to stay and tell you about Jesus and walk with Jesus and love Jesus. He wants to. He says, for your progress and joy. It, it says it's going to be evident to all. It's going to be visible. People are going to see the fruit that's being evident in Timothy's life. It's going to be manifested. All right. Closing thoughts. I think I have these on the screen. Listen to these. These were just mind-blowing to me. Writing, writing in the middle of the second century, the apologist Justin Martyr described a typical worship service of his day. He says, on the day called Sunday, there is a meeting in one place of those who live in cities or the country. And uh, the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. When the reader has finished, the president, uh, the president in a discourse urges and invites us to the imitation of these noble things. Then we all stand up together and offer prayers. And as said before, when we have finished the prayer, bread is brought and wine and water. And the president similarly sends up prayers and thanksgivings to the best of his ability. And the congregation assents, saying the amen. Another individual, the 4th century bishop of Constantinople, was nicknamed the Golden Mouth. John R. W. Stotts writes, He is generally and justly regarded as the greatest pulpit or, uh, orator of the Greek church, nor has he any superior or equal among the Latin fathers. He remains to this day a model for preachers in large cities. Four chief characteristics of his preaching may be mentioned. First, he was biblical. And you can read the rest in there. Secondly, his interpretation of the scripture was simple and straightforward. Thirdly, his moral applications were down to earth. Reading his sermons today, one can imagine without difficulty the pomp of the imperial court, the luxuries of the... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've been trying all day to say it and I can't get it. So just y'all can say it. In fact, the whole life of an... Uh, oriental city at the end of the fourth century fourthly he was fearless in his condemnations in fact he was a martyr of the pulpit for it was chiefly his faithful preaching that caused his exile here's i just want to tell you my goal i understand all these things apply to me right as a pastor i get this and i'm just going to tell you right now you can write this down or whatever you want if you're fast this is my goal as the pastor of god's church here in cedar edge my goal is to immerse myself in the biblical text to encourage people to follow the text and to teach its doctrines. My goal is to provide direct exposition of the scripture coupled with moral applications in a model for all preachers to imitate the word of God. So what? Where do we go from here? How does this apply to you as we walk out of here? Well, let me just give you a couple of things. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would ask you, to what extent are you involved in biblical ministry? And I pray that this church, God's church, with the leadership of godly men, is a biblical ministry. The priority of our church is the reading, the exhortation, and the preaching, teaching of God's word. I pray that we are setting the example. We are a model of biblical ministry. How, where, and when are we using our spiritual gifts within the biblical ministry? I pray that we will continue with a godly pursuit of biblical ministry as we have a personal pursuit of holiness. The application for you, I'm not going to list a bunch, but I'll leave you with the question, to what extent are you involved in the ministry that God is accomplishing in his church. Let's pray. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, James chapter 4 says, Life is a vapor, it appears for a little while, and then it is gone. It is vanished. Your next breath, my friend, is not a guarantee. 
You could get in the car in our little town in Cedar Edge and drive home, and a deer jumps out and you're dead. Life is over. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that you would come to understand that your sin is so serious. Your sin separates you from Jesus forever. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. And I, it is our sin that separates, G, separates us from Jesus for all of eternity. Leviticus 19.2, it says, God says, you shall be holy for I am holy. God's standard is perfection. Guys, we have broken that. We have never achieved perfection. We never can achieve perfection. If you think that you are good, you are sadly deceived. Because if we look at God's standard of perfection, and if we were just to ask the one question, when you were a child or if you are a child, have you ever dishonored your mom or dad? That one sin right there separates you from Jesus from all of eternity. Maybe you are the perfect child, you're the golden child, and you never sinned, you never argued with your parents. Well, the Bible says you are not to lie. You are now a liar. And we could go on and on and on. The Bible says you should not use God's name in vain. If you've ever said, oh my God, you are a blasphemer at heart. The Bible says you should not commit adultery. A lot of us are like, oh, I've never done that. Well, the Bible says, Jesus says, if you look at somebody and have lusted at them, you committed adultery in your heart. The Bible says you shall not murder. Well, we're all golden there, right? Nobody has killed anybody. I hope you haven't. But every one of us are murderers at heart. Do you know that? 1 John chapter 4 says that if you've hated somebody, you've murdered them. And so God's standard is perfection. We have broken that standard. We're separated from Jesus forever, and we deserve to go to hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The amazing thing is that God sent Jesus to this earth who lived a perfect life, who died a horrific death because of you and because of me. And then he went to the grave and he rose again three days later for you. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, All who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. We are the ones who broke God's standard of perfection. If you're here and don't understand the seriousness of your sin, talk to me after the service today. Because your next breath is not a guarantee. You may die. And I would ask you, if that is you, what's keeping you from coming to Jesus right now? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are a good God. Father, I'm so thankful that you are a faithful God. Lord, I'm so thankful that the word of God says that your word will not return void. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would help us to continue to be faithful. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful. Not just content in our walk with Jesus, but I pray for my friends and my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here. I pray that each one of us would really evaluate and see how are we involved in the biblical ministry. I pray, Father, that your church would always be committed to your word, to the, the preaching, the teaching, the reading, the exhortation. Father, I pray that we each would be found faithful using our gifts within the body of Christ for the glory of your name. And Father, I pray that we would all be committed to our personal pursuit of holiness as we seek to become more like our Savior, not because that earns us merit with our God, but because we love our God, we have a desire to walk with our God. And Lord, if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, I pray that they would come to understand the seriousness of sin, but the remedy is the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. I ask that you use these things for your glory and for your praise. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.